Okay, so good afternoon everyone and thanks for joining us today for the webinar. I'm Amy and I'm here as part of our regular webinar team with Sam. Um, as always, or if you haven't been to a webinar before, please make sure you familiarize yourself with the GoToWebinar panel on the right hand side, which you can expand and collapse using the orange arrow. We also have one of our support colleagues monitoring the questions box today and it is within this panel where you can ask questions throughout but please do keep in mind that um, the questions should be limited to the topics that we're going to be talking to um, and not just general support questions so we are also recording this webinar so if you need to leave early at any point don't worry and um, we can send the recording out afterwards um, and again if you do need to leave early but you've asked a question or if we don't get time to answer all of the questions within the time we'll follow these up on email afterwards as well so how did we actually come to uh, decide to do this topic? Uh, well, myself and Sam recently had quite an interesting conversation with our support team where it was highlighted that there are a lot of topics that often crop up as issues that the team handle uh, more often than others. So we thought maybe it'd be useful to host a webinar to cover some of the topics um, and then try and give those relevant solutions alongside them. As well as the fact that we thought it might just be quite interesting for you to hear what other service desks struggle with as well as yourselves perhaps. So today we want to be able to give you some tips directly from our support team um, to prepare you should any of these issues actually happen to yourselves, whilst giving you access to the relevant knowledge articles to reflect on, um, which will hopefully save you some time on the way as well. And we also wanted to refresh uh, how you can contact support in the future, uh, just in case you do need anything. So like I said, the webinar is going to give tips and solutions, um, but the solutions will be quite top level today, um, just because of the length of the webinar. So if you are struggling with the more technical settings, you can always still get in touch with support. But first, let's um, look at some of the uh, the more commonly asked questions, and I'm going to pass you over to Sam for that, who will take you through the first of those. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, so for each query, I will explain what the problem is, and we'll then go through the solution too, um, as well as any associated knowledge items available in our extranet for you to read. Now, lots of questions we get asked are about the mail import, so I'll start off with a few on this topic. The first being that the mail import isn't working as expected. But what's the solution here? Well, there might be a number of reasons why the mail import isn't working for you. Firstly, the mail import will only import unread messages. So for example, ones that haven't been clicked on or replied to. It also won't automatically work if a message has a large attachment. So in Outlook, we're talking about uh, more than 20 megabytes. And thirdly, often our customers don't realize that they need to define a user that works on behalf of the mail account connected with the mail import. Otherwise, Topdesk may try to access the account, but its credentials are out of date. So just remember to keep this account in line with your ICT guidelines and processes. So for example, um, maybe for you, the password for the account may need to be updated every six months. For more information, you can check out knowledge item 7129 in the extranet. Oh, also, uh, don't worry about needing to note down this KI uh, as I'll be recapping all knowledge items at the end of the webinar for you as well. Now, moving on, the second common mail import issue is that emails will not trigger from it. The problem here is to do with events and actions in Topdesk. In order for the event to actually occur, some form of manual user input is required, e.g. a status is changed. But as the mail import is automatic, uh, there's no user available to trigger the event. But what's the solution to this? We need to set up, for example, uh, an event that will trigger a certain amount of time, let's say one minute, after an incident is created in Topdesk. This will ensure that a manual activity will happen to trigger that email. Alas, the mail import may still not work as often the confirm before sending email setting in Topdesk is automatically ticked. If so, you'll need to disable this in order to allow the mail to send out. And you can see that I've popped a screenshot of this uh, on the right hand side there. And that setting is found under the additional tab of a mail action. Thirdly, uh, and this one really does occur very frequently, uh, customers come to us asking for help fixing mail loops that have occurred due to the mail import. Sometimes thousands of emails will loop and people will wonder why on earth their top desk is running so slowly before discovering a lot of emails attached to the ticket. Now this problem happens because if you get an undeliverable response or an out of office email from an email you send out of top desk, 
the undeliverable will auto update into the call in top desk as well. Then another automatic email will be sent out of top desk and therefore a loop starts. The resolution to this is a workaround. Um, so on the mail server, you can set up mail rules. For example, if a message is received from X, put it in folder Y if its subject contains undeliverable. Um, now a quick note on folder Y that I mentioned. So this must be a folder that isn't linked to the mail import already. You can also contact our support team for guidance about other mail rules you can set up as they're just a phone call away. But alternatively, you can see this for yourself under knowledge item 10145. The fourth question on this topic is how to update a call status when the call is updated by the mail import. Our customers want to be able to see if one of their customers has responded to an incident via email or if an email has been imported into an existing incident. Well, you can set the status of a call to update automatically to inform you of this. Now to do so, for incident management, you want to open up the mail import settings within import settings. Now this may be under functional settings, depending on the version of top desk you're using. Then open up a mailbox and navigate to the if email refers to existing incident block within the incident settings tab. Here you can define the status that the call will change to, for example, updated by caller. This status will be set automatically after a successful mail import occurs. And this setting can be defined for open, completed and closed incidents. So you can select it as you wish. Um, I have included a screenshot for you on the next slide just to show you where this is. Um, but for more information, such as how to configure the automatic status update for requests for change, uh, please do see uh, knowledge item 7550 in the extranet. Oh, and if you want to set this up for the self-service portal, it's pretty straightforward too. You just need to go to the top desk module settings, then to call management, then to general, and then set the status change you want if a call is modified, closed, or reopened. And here's that screenshot that I promised you uh, with the uh, mail import settings on it. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is in relation to changes to self-service portal branch settings. And what exactly do I mean by this? Well, the tick box for filling in uh, an SSP request form on behalf of someone from a different branch is no longer ticked by default within a person card in top desk. So the solution to this, well, if you're finding that existing and newly imported users don't have this setting ticked, our support team can both run a database query and modify the import script for you for free to set this up for all users. Now that may be users you already have in the system, or it could be um, the new uh, users that you want to import, and that would be to do with updating the import script. Um, just please do get in touch with our support team if this is something that you would like to do. And for more information, uh, as always, head over to the extranet to knowledge item 9996, which is fairly ominous. Now, this is where that tick box can be found if you are interested. Um, but for now, I'm going to head uh, pass you back over to Amy and she's going to cover some FAQs to do with reporting, HTTP requests and more. Perfect. Thanks, Sam. Um, so the first issue that I'm going to look at is a, is a reporting based question. So customers sometimes find that after they've created a report and sent it out to the different stakeholders, that the recipients can't see all of the relevant information that they're actually expected to see from the report. Um, so this is due to an option that's given when scheduling report. So reports are viewed based on the permissions. So if yours are different from the user that the report is being sent to, um, there's that risk there that the important data will be missing from the, the report itself. So in order to stop this from happening, um, when you are scheduling the report, you can choose from the drop down shown in the image on the slides um, that this can be viewed as a particular operator. So this allows for end users to see relevant data once the schedule has been reported and sent to them. And straight on to the next one is uh, another one that's to do with the reporting. Um, one question that comes into the team is why when we're creating reports, not all table or chart options are actually available to choose from step four out of the five steps. So this one actually comes down to how you group the information when you're creating that report. So this is step three of, of the report steps. Um, if you don't group the data, the output will not have enough layers or specific criteria to actually warrant a more in-depth report. So, for example, if you're grouping data in at least one way, such as um, calls by operator, um, 
a pie chart would have multiple options, whereas if you'd just done it on all calls, it would just be the one solid colour um, with just the total number of calls being analysed. And this is also the same with reports that are posted to the self-service portal, uh, where the user can actually choose and swap between the types of desired visual output for the report. But again, if you've not actually grouped the data, not all of these options will show or give useful stats for your end users. So a simple solution for this is just to ensure that you have grouped that data in the third step of the report, which is the tab you can see on the screenshot. Um, so think about how you want to analyze the data and what it is you'd like to see and how you think that this would be great, best grouped for the report that you want to publish. And once you've added these elements, the full selection of visual outputs relevant to the data that you've selected should be available to you again. Uh, so the next FAQ is some customers do get in touch when um, they notice that despite a call being marked as closed, there's sometimes a discrepancy between those marked close, which are still appearing as being in progress, um, and that's due to its status. This is because the tick box is of the true status of a call, and if this is ticked, the record is technically closed, but if the status is still set to being in progress, it can still appear in certain selections of data across the system. Um, and what I mean with the tick box being the true status in top desk means that this tick box actually closes the record itself, whereas the status in top desk is a label assigned to the record to visually track the progress, or it can be used to help filter records through the system, like when you're making a selection or on different types of lists of calls. Um, and a named label such as a status doesn't actually trigger that closure of the ticket by default. So the status dropdown will only trigger the closure of the ticket if this has actually been set up via the stated seal determines processing status, um, which is in the settings, which I'll show you in a moment. So the solution for this is doable in the top desk settings itself. Um, like we were saying, what I can do is set up top desk so that when the dropdown actually changes to close, the, the checkbox will actually auto tick, and um, which will then hopefully remove any human error and iron out the issues um, by doing one and the other one happening automatically rather than missing one and, and messing up the, uh, the, the selections you'll have in the tool afterwards. So as you can see on the slides, um, I've put some simple steps there, which is actually from one of the knowledge items at the bottom. Um, so this one here is for instant management. Initially, you need to be able to ensure that the status checkbox in the general settings of incident management has been checked to show that the status will determine that calls have been completed or closed. And once this has been done and saved, you'll then need to make sure that the status has matched the desired processing status, which you can find in the drop-down setting of incident management within the module settings. So for more information on this, you can either go to the knowledge items uh, mentioned on the slides, and depending on whether you want this to be for instant management or change management, um, there's two different ones that you can see there as well. And for the next um, FAQ, I've actually split it into two parts. So this one's tailored more to our SaaS customers, um, as there's times where SaaS customers can't uh, get their emails working, they're struggling to get them to go out of the, um, the mailbox. So the most common reason for this is down to when a SaaS customer is sending emails from our server, which is the default setup. So this means that emails are coming from at topdesk.net. However, um, if we take an example of our webinar team, if we wanted to do this, and we wanted our emails to come out from at webinar.net. But to do this, Topdesk has to actually pretend that the email is coming from at webinar.net, um, which can often cause confusion um, to the mail server. And if it does manage to see through its cunning disguise, it will actually mark the email as spam. So in order to get around this, um, what you'd need to do is set up an SPF record, which will allow top, at topdesk.net to send emails as that other domain. So this isn't something that I can go through with you now as it's not actually a top desk setting. Um, but if you are trying to do this, please refer to the knowledge item at the bottom, which is 5544. Um, and if you are struggling to do that, then hopefully this will help. But again, if not, do get in touch with top desk support. And the second part of this one um, relates to if SaaS customers are using their own infrastructure to connect. Um, so this isn't an SPF problem this time, um, but errors can be popping up such as the user account password expiring, which is actually similar to something that Sam was talking to you about earlier. So as well as this, um, IT may have to change firewall settings to check that it doesn't think that Topdesk is trying to penetrate through that firewall. So one solution is to update the mail server to make sure that it's reachable from the Topdesk SaaS domain by whitelisting RIP addresses. 
Um, and from the two knowledge items on the slide, the second one is actually useful um, if you want to see the default settings in place when trying to set up an SMTP emails using Office 365. Um, and it also includes the steps for SSL certification um, that will be required. So please do look into that if you're trying to do that for yourself. And the final one that I would like to talk you through before I do pass you back to Sam is about HTTP requests um, that have been set up. So it could be that you've had HTTP requests for some time and you've never had an issue with them, then suddenly they just no longer want to work for you. A reason that can crop up with this is um, it's because our customers have moved from a non-secure connection to HTTPS. And the solution to this um, would be that as the original requests were set up as HTTP rather than HTTPS, you'll need to update the SSL certificate within the HTTP settings so that Topdesk knows that it can use HTTPS instead. Um, and this is done in the Topdesk Trust Store. So the steps that need to update the SSL certificate in the Topdesk Trust Store can be found in the knowledge item, which is the 5169 at the bottom. But that brings me to the end of the points that I was going to cover. Um, so I'm going to pass you back to Sam, uh, who's going to talk about those ways you can contact support and recap some of the things that we've talked about today. Yep, so let's take a look at how you can contact support if there's something you want to fix for yourself or if you need to give us a call about a tricky issue. So there are a number of ways that you can get in touch with us. If you'd like to have a chat with one of our friendly support team, then do give us a call on the number on the slide. Um, some of you do like to give us a call on the 4200 number um, as well, and that is absolutely fine. Uh, you will just come through to our main top desk UK line, and you might actually even get to speak to myself or Amy if you're lucky. Um, but one of us can easily transfer you through the support as well. Additionally, on the Top Desk Extranet, there's a ton of information in the form of knowledge items um, that may well fix your issue without needing to raise a call. But please do create a new ticket from there if you can't find a resolution. Emailing support on support.topdesk.co.uk will also create a ticket in our support's Top Desk that will start working on for you as fast as we possibly can. And finally, there's a dedicated support page on our website, which you may want to bookmark and all of the information on this slide is available there too. But here's a quick recap of all the FAQs that we've talked about today, alongside their associated KIs in the extranet. So number one was that the mail import had stopped working altogether. Number two, that emails were not triggering from the mail import. Thirdly, mail loops were happening uh, when emails were imported in their thousands uh, number four was uh, automatically updating a call status when it was updated by the mail import five was submitting forms on behalf of others in the self-service portal then number six was looking at reports showing different results depending on who was viewing them for seven not all displayed options were available when creating reports eight was that calls are left open when the tick box had officially closed the record we then took a look at some issues for SaaS customers sending emails out of top desk. And finally, number 10 was about HTTP requests stopping working after moving to HTTPS. Do remember as well that support are always available if you need them. Um, so if, if any of these um, don't answer your questions or if anything's unclear, then please do just uh, give us a call. And that's all from us today. But as always, we'll be putting a recording of today's webinar on YouTube um, so you can replay the content at any time. And if you would like to ask us any further questions, then please do stick around and we'll do our best to get back to you. If we don't manage to answer all of your questions today, then we'll be sure to email you a response shortly. But thanks again on behalf of myself, Amy and Top Desk Support and enjoy the rest of your day.